Stanford University. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Vanessa Chang. I am a PhD candidate in modern thought and literature, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here on behalf of the Graphic Narrative Project. I have been the coordinator of the Graphic Narrative Project for the past two years, and happy to announce our new coordinator, Mia Lewis. We're now in our fifth year. We are a Gabal research workshop with the Stanford Humanities Center, dedicated to advancing the study and practice of graphic storytelling. In the last four years, we've had the great privilege of bringing an amazing array of artists and scholars to Stanford to talk comics. Hosting the Hernandez brothers here is the cherry on top of an exquisite comics confection. Thanks. This, <laughs> I had to. <laughs> this event is possible thanks to the generous support of our co-sponsors who have all shown great enthusiasm in helping to bring the Hernandez brothers to Stanford. Their excitement and willingness to help make this event happen speaks volumes about the incredible reach of their art and how deeply it has touched so many. With much gratitude, I'd like to say thank you to the Wendy Munger and Leonard Gumport Visiting Artists and Scholars Fund and the Stanford Arts Institute, the Program in Modern Thought and Literature, the Graphic Novel Project and the Creative Writing Program, the Program in Writing and Rhetoric, the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, the American Studies Program, the Stanford Storytelling Project, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Institute for Diversity in the Arts. Also a big thank you to Ricardo Padilla um, and the Latino Comics Expo for working with us to make this happen. And of course, thank you Jaime, Gilbert, and Mario for joining us here today. And now, moving on to the main event, I'd like to introduce our discussants from Stanford, all of whom I've had the great pleasure of working with and coming to call my friends. Scott Buchatman is a professor in the Film and Media Studies program in the Department of Art and Art History here at Stanford, as well as the faculty coordinator for the Graphic Narrative Project. He's a scholar and teacher of popular media, including film, musicals, science fiction, superheroes, and of course, comics. He's the author of several books, including The Poetics of Slumberman, Slumberland, <laughs> uh, Animated Spirits, and The Animating Spirit, and he's just wrapping up a book on the comic Hellboy. An avowed comics fan, Scott has been buying Love and Rockets since issue two. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Ramon Saldivar is the Hoagland Family Professor of English and Comparative Literature here at Stanford. He's the author of several books that include Chicano Narratives, The Dialectics of Difference, and also The Borderlands of Culture, Americo Paredes, and The Transnational Imaginary. Ramon recently received the National Humanities Medal from President Obama for his pioneering work on Chicano and other cross-cultural ethnic identities. And finally, I'd like to introduce Angela Becerra Vitergar, without whose energy and love for comics, I would not be standing here introducing this event. Angela has a PhD in comparative literature from Stanford. She's co-founder of the Graphic Narrative Project, editor-in-chief of its upcoming comic studies journal, Ideograph, and the host and executive producer of the radio program, The Human Angle. She will be our moderator this evening. And then, without further ado, let's get started. Well, I am so pleased to be introducing you to the Hernandez brothers this evening. It's a moment that I've really been waiting for since Helen Shin and I co-founded the Graphic Narrative Project six years ago now. It's a long time to be waiting <laughs> for this moment. Um, I remember very clearly one of the first of the many visits that I would make to Ramon Saldivar's office during my time here at Stanford. and, and as I was scanning the shelves of the wonderful books that surrounded me in his uh, library at his office, my eyes landed on a spine that stood out, tall and proud among the literary theory, the novels, and the anthologies. And I pulled out this very copy of Music for Mechanics. <laughs> 
I came to comics a bit later in life, unlike I think many of those of you who are here today. Uh, so this was my first encounter with Mario, Jaime, and Gilbert's truly spellbinding, irresistibly cool black and white panels. And like the many, many readers of Love and Rocket since the Hernandez clan took up the charge in the underground comics movement of the 1980s, I've been taken in over and over by the oversized, fantastic, yet shockingly familiar reality of the worlds that they've created. As a Latina and a woman, I was surprised and thrilled to see my culture and my gender represented to a greater depth and with greater emphasis than in most comics that I had previously encountered. Since this conversation that we're gonna have here this evening is made to help you get to know the Hernandez brothers and their work in their own words, I will keep the rest of this introduction brief and just give you the lowdown on what they've published and pardon me from reading the rest of this because there, there's a lot to tell you about. <laughs> so Gilbert, Mario, and Jaime self-published the first issue of Love and Rockets back in 1981 and it included stories they wrote separately. It was promptly picked up and republished by Fantagraphics the following year and the long-running series has brought together many of their one-off and ongoing stories, though some threads dominate the series, such as Gilbert's Palomar series and Jaime's Locas. The stories have often evoked comparisons with magical realism, with their interplay of realism and sci-fi or fantastic elements, and they're well known for their complex character development, as well as their incorporation of Chicano and punk rock culture. During a hiatus from Love and Rockets in the late 90s, Jaime published solo works that include Woe Nelly and Penny Century. His latest work, The Love Bunglers, features Maggie from Locas and was published earlier this year. Gilbert's solo works during that hiatus included New Love, Luba, and Luba's comics, and stories. Aside from Love and Rockets, Gilbert has published other things such as Girl Crazy, Birdland, Grip, and Sloth, the Fritz B-movie graphic novels called Chance in Hell, The Troublemakers, and Love from the Shadows, as well as the series Speak of the Devil. His latest works include Julio's Day, Marble Season, Maria M, Bumperhead, and Lover Boys. And you'll see some of those covers um, going by up there on the screen. Outside of Love and Rockets, Mario published a one-shot comic called Brain Capers. He and Gilbert also collaborated on the sci-fi miniseries, Citizen Rex. So please join me in welcoming the Hernandez brothers. So I'm gonna open up our conversation actually with a question for Mario. Um, I would love for you to tell us a bit about how this all got started. You know, how you got into comics in the first place oh, and geez. what led you to start. <laughs> <laughs> it starts in 1940, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Sounds, it starts pretty, <laughs> no, pretty far back. It's true with her mom. Yeah. yeah, starts with my mom, who was uh, an avid comic fan back in the 40s, uh, living in a, a dirt floor place in Texas. And uh, she was a very avid comic reader and uh, was uh, also uh, could draw very very well and did uh, would copy things from the comics and every once in a while she would haul out these pictures that she had done of Superman and stuff and show us and uh, I don't know it just was really charmed us and, and we uh, and I just was very interested in comics they were very colorful you know you're like five six years old and you're just wow what are those you know and uh, just started, you know, picking them up little by little, and pretty soon you got stacks and stacks of them in the house. Uh, only because my mother liked them as well, and uh, she, uh, you know, and uh, my my dad was like, you know, one time like, it's raining outside. We can't send these little savages outside. So uh, why don't you get some of those books you used to like, and you know, read, you know, and let them read them, you know, get them. Anyway, uh, so. Uh, we, we, I just, you know, it, it was just a, like anything that was comics was uh, anything that was illustrated with words, anything like that, uh, which was only comic books at the time and comic strips in the newspaper, um, just fascinated well, me. And then it kind of uh, through osmosis to these guys. 
and uh, we uh, just we started drawing our own little comics on uh, torn paper bags, and then pretty soon on typing paper, and uh, and just kind of those stacked up because we just loved just just drawing, and then uh, just uh, from um, early ages, and uh, uh, just kept it rolling from there. Um, I, I, being the oldest one, was. Uh, uh, just uh, kind of moving on to other things. I was becoming early teens and things like that. And and I turned around one day, and these guys were still drawing these things. And I'm like, wow, you know? I mean, I thought I was hardcore. But, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, comics were just in the house, just in all kinds. It's it's sort of like uh, Top 40 radio back in the, in the day where you could hear country and pop and Barbara Streisand and Johnny Cash and, and rock music and the Beatles and the Stones and everything was just a big mix. It's, it's not like compartmentalized like it is on, on satellite radio now. Um, uh, it's just a, a, a total mix and then through variety shows and, and bad horror movies because we were, uh, since there were so many of us kids, you know, uh, mom would just also turn the TV on, like, like, you know, there's cartoons, there's horror movies, there's variety shows, there's Gilligan's Island, there's this other thing, you know, and we just saturated, we just soaked it all in. And, uh, you know, it, it came out in, in the work. Uh, and, uh, you know, pretty soon, you know, the comics are overflowing and uh, they're, uh, you know, becoming uh, all of our, 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 our art, got better, uh, some of us better than others. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's uh, I, pretty good. So one. Sure. what were you looking at when you guys were thinking about publishing, taking the stuff that you were doing and publishing it? What were you looking at as a model for putting something together, turning it into a comic book and putting well, it out there? It was all the, the fanzine days. There was the, the fanzine days of the, uh, I guess it's the 70s? In the 80s? 60s? 60s? Very much in the 60s. Yeah, it was the uh, fanzines where people were just putting stuff on, on, in, uh, like uh, they'd make a fanzine and sell it through the mail. And uh, they would ask for illustrations or uh, articles or whatever. And these guys would do Iron Man or something, you know, really good stuff too. Um, to, uh, uh, and, and so I just thought, well, you know, uh, it had it had run its course. It had kept going, but it was kind of like on its way out. But I thought it was still going on at, uh, yeah. when we started loving rockers. I thought, oh, let's do one of those, you know, kind of like a fanzine kind of thing, uh, and uh, you know, put our own comics in there. And uh, when uh, Jaime and Gilbert showed me what they wanted to do, I was like, wait, when did you start drawing like this? <laughs> when did this? When did this become from this, this sort of you know very crude drawings to this wow, you know, kind of new elaborate thing and it was because from years and years of just doing it over and over again and it just you know, evolved and uh, into what uh, you know and there was a couple of other bumps on the way of Jaime going to art school I went as well and having real well, you mean uh, a junior college junior college we take art classes that's what you mean art I school. call it art school <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, um, yeah um, I never really thought of it in that way till you just mentioned it, that we approached it like a kind of a do-it-yourself thing because I didn't know how to be professional. I didn't know how to draw Spider-Man. I didn't know, you know, all that stuff. And I, ne I knew I would never move to New York and work for the Right, that's what we thought, that companies. you had to be from New York or be in New York to do comics, yeah. period. So. But... Uh, but, at, but Right at that time, I was a cocky punk rocker, and I said, "Okay, well, I'm just going to do it this way. I don't, I don't want to do it their way, you know." Mm -hmm. But, uh, but um, part of it was just that small town mentality of like, uh, "Well, I want to do comics. Okay, they're not going to be color, and they're not going to be this, but they're going to be mine, you know. That's all. I, that's all I need, you know. And to be published, I, I wasn't thinking of the big picture." So, uh, in a way, that's, yeah, it was kind of the, that punk rock cockiness and uh, that small town naivete, you know. Gilbert, you have anything to say? Um, well, comics? Uh, well, I started drawing comics at the year, age of five, so start now if you want to. <laughs> <coughs> uh, Mario decided, I don't know why, I never asked you why, but Mario decided, uh, I guess it was just to keep us quiet or it was just a rainy day or something. You, you, you were drawing a Superman comic. 
And I think moms just said, show him how to do it. And so I just basically sat next to you, you know, and you're drawing a Superman comic. I remember in the cover, he's, it's the back of him. He's looking and he's using his x-ray vision. And I went, wow. So, you know, cause we had Superman comics in the house and I thought, Oh, you, you just drew your own, you know, like that, that's kind of cool. So I thought, well, I can't do Superman. So I'm going to create Spaceman. And I remember, you know, it's uh, I think I had a ballpoint pen and, you know, just, uh, you know, typing paper, or whatever, and I, and I remember, paper. yes, stenographer papers, and I just showed you, it's, it's, and I asked Mario to spell spaceman for me, and he kind of thought about it, and goes, okay, <laughs> no, and, uh, and I just drew a couple of panels, and then I drew a big face of him smiling, that's all the only stuff I remember from it, and we did a few of those, but then we kind of just forgot about it, it was just sort of a thing to do that day, and then Mario told me, he goes, hey, those, the, the guys are doing comics again, I was like, what? And it was our younger brother, Ricardo, and Jaime were making comics. And we didn't even notice that, you know, it's like, that, you know I'd just forgotten about it, kind of. They were beneath us at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then they started doing comics again. And so I thought, oh, that, it's my duty to draw comics as well. And so from then on, we just started doing comics, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember why you decided to do them? Just I don't remember what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, see, he was so small. We were so young. I don't even, it's, it's yeah. so vague, you know. I mean, it was, you know... It was five, the five brothers. So, you know, if Mario did it, Gilbert did it, and Gilbert did it, Richie did it. If Richie did it, I did it. You know, it was just the trickle down. Trickle down economics. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't remember why I wanted to do these. I just knew because they were doing it, so mm -hmm. that was cool. Yeah. And uh, so, but, you know, our, uh, super, like our comics were, that b back then, or a little later, were more like uh, Turkish superhero movies where... I don't know if you've seen any of those, where it's Spider-Man versus Godzilla, that kind of thing, or Star Trek versus uh, King Kong or something. Uh, th they were like that. I had Sp uh, Iron Man w uh, fighting the blob, or you know, you'd mix Frankenstein with Spider-Man or something like that, because nobody was going to ever see this stuff except us, you know. So that's how we, we kind of did it. We just that's where the creativity and just the DIY thing came. Is just well, we're gonna. Spider-Man can't meet Godzilla, but he can in our comic book. You know, that's, um, and so that's where the imagination and, and just the push to, to, to do it our way it came from, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, the, the, the evolution was simply, uh, um, like Mario said, in those days, uh, you read, if you were really into comics, you read pretty much anything of quality that was out at the time. You know, the kids' comics, the even the, the teen Archie comics, the uh, Marvel comics, DC, horror comics, whatever. And Mario had such a mania for just the uh, the, the storytelling aspect of, of comics, you know, the, the, the really good illustrations and the story. We'd even, uh, I remember even looking at, we would look at uh, ads for like Schwinn bikes or something, and Mario would always point out which, who, which artist that was. So we started getting into the artists, you know. So we had quite a, we were just had, so, we were so completely drawn to it for some reason. It just, it worked for us, you know. And so, and learning to draw, uh, that just fed into it, and uh, it just continued until, you know. Um, you guys are talking a lot about uh, what you like to draw and creating comics out of things that you like to draw. Can you talk a little bit about your evolution as writers? Because that's like an equal component of what you do now. And at some point, did you start writing? How, how did writing enter into this, and how did it change? Well, for, for me, it was, um, I, I was never a good English student or a, a good writer. Um, but I thought that was the smart part of comics. If you could write a story, that was the smart part. Drawing just came naturally. Just, you know, you just draw it. Who cares? But I remember because at an early age, I thought if I'm going to do comics... And if I'm going to do a line of comics, this was even when we were still doing it on typing paper, I thought, I got to back this up and I got to make it real. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. You know, I didn't know how to write or anything. So, uh, so I kind of just uh, um, kind of took the strength of the art and then, and then helped. That was half the writing there. You know, and so, um, and my, and even when we started Love and Rockets, I was like, okay, uh, Gilbert's the storyteller. I'm not, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hope my characters can carry the stories for him. And I would say 90% uh, of my work to this day is, has been uh, on the backs of my characters. <laughs> 
just imagine we uh, had a, an ear for it, like watching so many TV shows and, and you know, and watch, say, watching The Twilight Zone or something, and just the way the characters talked. It wasn't a conscious thing we absorbed. It was just, you know, when, once you got had a character that you were interested in, they spoke uh, by themselves, you know. So obviously we're picking it up from somewhere. And even conversations we had with friends, that, that would end up, because since we didn't have anything to write about, we didn't, I've never written a plot in my life, but, I, but I've created characters that simply talk to each other, and at least in the early days, and I just imagine that, um, well, the, the way to be original is to put down what I've heard in real life, because nobody else heard it, you know? And, and, and I didn't do that as any kind of marketing scheme or anything. It was just to have a story there, to have them talk about things. Uh, so it just fell, apart, uh, fell together that way. Um, I, I just tried to get conversations, because I always thought growing up, um, was, uh, we were just talking about this, like we would hang out and like we, we would take classes that were really boring, like say a, a wood shop or metal shop or something. But the guys in the class were very funny because we're, they're all uh, future losers, right? So, but they're very funny the way they interacted. And that was also something I thought, well, that's not in movies or TV or in comics. That could be somewhere. That belongs somewhere. I didn't know when we could explore that, when, where that could be. And, I, and, and once we had, a, a, you know, we started doing comics, hey, just, just put it there. Just put it there. It's okay. Because um, the underground comics are, are what freed me the most as far as that goes, as far as putting down whatever, uh, uh, you know, you wanted to put down on paper because there was no real, there was no really punk comics. There was no, it, it wasn't, I mean, there was the sort of fanzini type stuff, but there's no real storytelling. And, and at least the underground artists, the good ones, you know, were trying to be storytellers. And so they had the freedom of just putting down what they wanted. So when I thought about writing stories about, whatever I wanted to, and putting the dialogue in from real life, I thought more along uh, undergrounds. I thought of Robert Crumb, uh, how he just had people talking, yet his stories were very engaging, more real than a Spider-Man comic. You know, as much as I liked a Spider-Man comic, then I, I would read a Zap comic or Crumb stuff, and even if he was just going off on whatever nutty thing he was going off on, it, it had a connection to he was speaking to you the way you know, we speak to each other, sort of. And uh, this... Uh, 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 this this sort of th grip he had on uh, like what what happens in real life should be in comics. Um, I remember t just being re both of us really drunk teenagers, and we're sitting there, and he's and he says, "Comics needs to be better. Comics need to be more than superheroes, you know." And I'm just like, <laughs> "Preach, man, preach," you know. And he's like, he uh, "Tequila." And we're just literally he pouring had, out of his car. He looked like <laughs> an, and, and he pissed me off because he looked like an Apache. He had long, <laughs> straight hair like this lady right here. <laughs> and mine was all like frizzy on one side and curly on the other, and but not in the back kind of thing, you know. So I was always like, nah. yeah, but uh, and and he and he drew this thing about a guys going to a party and getting drunk one time, and I looked and I go. Wow, you know, where is this? And he goes, it's you know, comics should be about South America, about a village in South America. I don't know, it, you know, okay, you know, whatever, you know. This, what about superheroes? What about you know, uh, spacemen and stuff? I was more into the pulpy aspects of it. And um, anyway, so uh, anyway, that's that's how far back it was that he was just thinking about this. And then it, when it became Palomar and stuff, I'm like, whoa, it, there it goes, you know? That, um, but like uh, putting Palomar on paper was, was partially due, you know, it was a number, a combination of things. Um, one of them was newspaper strips. I like the idea that classic uh, newspaper strips, uh, the, the famous ones, like they lasted a long time. So that, to me, that meant it, that's important. That means they have some kind of quality because if they lasted so many years. And then when Mari started uh, showing me books about classic newspaper strips. He goes, this, been going, this strip's been going on for 40 years. This one going on for 50 years. I thought, well, that's, that's just amazing. There must be something important about it. I didn't know some of those strips were just boring and they just stuck them in the newspaper because they had to fill in that space or whatever. I, that didn't matter to me. It was more that it had longevity and they were household names. A lot of the characters in the old newspaper strips were household names. And I wanted that. I wanted something like, I'd like to create a character that uh, like, people talk about. You know, I, you know it's a fantasy of, of mine. And also, uh, and there was a very few comics, but uh, there was some that uh, inspired me to do that too, comic books. And, uh, and on top of the heap was a, a comic book called Little Archie. And it was basically Archie comics, but they let this artist draw them uh, and write the stories he wanted to his way. 
He, he was unfettered by the Archie teen world and, mm -hmm. and trying to sell a product or whatever they're trying to do. He just decided to do stories about little kids. Uh, but he kind of went off in, on his own and he made the kids very thoughtful and reflective in these little, little just kid stories. And that was very uh, inspiring me to do something like that. I thought, I want to do comics like that guy because he reminds me of writing about you know, how my life was. Even though you know, they're completely different, they're, they're, they're little Archie stories, I just felt like I, I was there and uh, I could relate to him. Uh, that, that was one of the things. And then um, seeing, growing up later and, and discovering uh, film, like uh, particularly uh, like foreign films, because they seem more down to earth, because you know, you'd see classic films. Uh, PBS was the only place you could see them on TV at the time when I was growing up. And so they would have Ingmar Bergman Festival or Federico Fellini. And part of the draw is that you might get the chance to see a naked lady. Right, mm -hmm. in, in a foreign mo movie in the, from the 50s. That was the, that, that's why they got, believe it or not, that's why they got sold to American audiences, because you could, might be able to see a titty or something, you know? Um, but it was under the, 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 the umbrella of art, art film. I go, well, this is great. Have naked ladies and it's art. You know, what's it, that's the perfect combination. So, but <laughs> once I started seeing the films, <laughs> and you know, I didn't, you know, once you know, the, the, the nudity just became you know, part of the film, I was into the stories and the characters, and usually they were the ones, they, they, they would sh the ones I would see and the ones they showed were the ones that were about, you know, uh, the neorealist Italian movies, where people were poor and struggling, but it was all about characterization more than, their, more than uh, door slamming. So, um, no, anyway, that was, so the, I, I just put it, I just, I just pulled from all those sources where I just thought, well, you can just do stuff about people talking, hanging out, and that's, that could be considered art. I'm not saying that that's where I was going for, and I, that, that was my goal to make a big art, artistic statement. It was just more that you could, you could tell those types of stories and use those kind of characters, and people will, could relate to them. The, as luck would have it, it, it became even more, that even became more of a bigger a bigger deal than I expected. I never expected Palomar to be anything other than another comic book and amusement. You know, uh, people just got really into it and really and and you know just related to the characters and such. And I wasn't going to argue. I was just going to keep doing it. You know, okay. You know, had, I needed I needed a life. I had something to do. So I just continued uh, mm -hmm. doing that. You know, you've been talking about uh, the kinds of things that you were looking at and, and reading in other forms, um, but you also said something that really caught my ear a little while ago, and that that you were uh, you were you know uh, you started out in Texas, in Texas, and um, you know whether uh, you know is part of your growing up, and then later whether other forms like music, Mexican music in particular, mu Mexican television, uh, well, uh, yeah. or comics in, oh, yeah. in Spanish right, were part of what you were thinking about as well. Oh well, uh, to to be to correct that, that, our mother was from Texas, uh, yeah, but okay. we grew up in Southern California. But yeah, we were exposed to that because our dad was from Mexico. Yeah. He listened yeah. to Mexican music. The television yeah. was on on uh, channel uh, channel thirty four. That was yeah. b back then was the only you know station, and and movies were on variety shows. You know, uh, I like. You know, yeah, sports. You know yeah. that I. You know, yeah. you wouldn't see on other channels back then. Now they have cable and, and satellite and all that stuff and streaming. It's all over. But you could, do, you know, those days it, it, specific things were on specific channels. So yeah. he would have that on, and yeah. and you know, and, all, and his and you know, and his brothers would come over, and they were worse than us. I mean, they were just just wild and funny and just you know crazy because they're guys from Mexico, you know, and. Uh, mm -hmm. And they spoke Spanish all the time, and uh, you know, even though half the time I didn't know what they were talking about, yeah. I could I could get the vibe of what was going yeah. on, you know. Uh, so that was that was a lot of it too, you know, just having that, you know, coming into our lives and having uh, and some of it unconsciously just putting it in our comic, yeah. you know, just coming out sure. and putting it in the comic. Yeah, just going to like uh, an uncle's house, like Tio Lalo's house, you know, uh, about. 15 minutes away, you had chickens. You just saw, <laughs> yeah, you saw the old country. You had yeah. goats and chickens. We were like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you just step into an, an old uncle's house from Mexico, and, and you were in Mexico, you know? Yeah. You just, you know, you'd be from the street, you know, in, in yeah. Southern California, and you walk past the, fe the old fence, yeah. you know, and you're in Mexico, you know? Yeah. So it was, it was, you know, it was, but it was home, yeah. you know, it was, it was, it was a, and, and that's another thing we wanted to capture, at least partially, is as home. Like, you don't see home in, in, in a lot of things. Uh, that's the thing that even Robert Crumb uh, always talks about. Why well, he's, like he, he's very obsessed with the, the 1930s, early 1930s, because he always says, because it feels like home. Mm -hmm. And that was always something he wanted to capture when he got serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always thought about that. I go, yeah, yeah, we, we, we have home 
in our in our in our stuff because it's nobody else has it at least in and and another reason to do what we did in Love and Rockets is just because we didn't have to answer to any uh, studio executives. You know, you you pitch Palomar to a TV guy and you're saying no because they don't get it and you know it's not going to sell. The sponsors don't want it. You know, uh, same thing with you know movies and that that kind of stuff. So that's where you just go back to doing comics where nobody can tell you what to do. At least our comics, uh, indie comics. You know, you just do because I mean I'm sure. I've talked to people, uh, I've talked to the ex-publisher of DC Comics, where she said, oh, I loved Love and Rockets, I loved it, oh, when it came out, we, we at DC were just, we didn't know what to do, we thought, yeah, this is great, but of course we wouldn't have published it. I go, oh, you wouldn't want a comic that people liked? <laughs> okay, I never, I didn't say that, of course, because I'm still looking for a job with them, but uh, uh, no, she was very pleasant, but she tried to, but it was weird, like, how the, how it, then I just go, then it's just business, you're not making comics to be good, you're just selling Batman to be, make more money for the company, or Time Warner and stuff, so, I, you know, I was just like, you know, forget it, go away, and, you know, there was always this kind of hint, like, yeah, well, we'll be here, and you'll be gone, <laughs> I think she's selling, like, you know, Kind of works in a Goodwill or something now, and uh, <laughs> I don't know what the hell she does now. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're still making comics, so I don't know. Well, no, just I, to, I shouldn't pick on Goodwill actually. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, just to keep going with that um, that idea of home that you were really trying to infuse your comics with, um, can you talk about maybe how that's evolved over the years that you've been doing Love and Rockets, and um, even in some of your solo works, like? Um, while you were talking, I was actually thinking of Marble Season because that's what I liked the most about that book was that uh, it was a story that felt like home, and you were you know in those kids' homes, and you feel like you're you're there playing with them and doing the things they do, and it really takes you to that place. So, um, have you you know over the years reflecting and learning more about yourself and where you come from? Has that changed how? You depict it, or how you see um, it? Well, because uh, in the early uh, stories of Palomar and stuff, I was looking, I was looking for home. I was, I, or at least to put it on, you know, the pages and, and as much as I could. But as 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 time goes on, you know, I was more interested in other things, and and you know, just I just wanted to explore other other angles. And then, and by the time it came to Marble Season, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to do a graphic novel for John and Corley. I hadn't worked with him before. And I kept thinking about like you know I just you know it's I I didn't want to necessarily return I didn't want to go backwards and go back home I but I wanted to do the home that I haven't done yet I look at it that way more instead of like mm, I haven't done that kind of story you know for a long time it was more like I haven't done this story yet where I I just a semi autobiographical story where you know. Um, the TV shows the kid watches are ones we actually watch, the comic books, uh, that kind of, I just want to name names this time, because in the Palomar stories, I usually kind of make up, except for a few things like Disneyland or whatever, I, I usually make up the things that they're into, but this time I just wanted to name names uh, uh, for in the time frame, because that, that was just something I hadn't done, and uh, so, but yeah, I did really want to capture, uh, have at least one graphic novel, you know, at least one that, that just reflected home from beginning to end, instead of distractions with you know, like my other stories go different ways, but this one was just about that. I, I kept it, I say semi-autobiographical because I kept it, I mean, th there's some grim stuff in it, but not the real grim stuff that <laughs> yeah. that we suffered and perpetrated our people. You know, I might do that story someday, mm -hmm. the cruel stuff. I want to hear Jaime answer that, that, that question as well, Jaime, because... Um, Locus, the, 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 the neighborhood that these guys live in and have grown up in and have moved away from. That's such a fundamental part of your work. And in, in all the work, you know, I don't know, if, for those who don't know, I mean, these characters have aged, they've changed, they've moved. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about the development of um, that kind of lengthy storytelling, that sense of place, and how your growing up has, you know, impacted those stories. Well, um, when, when I did the first stuff, my main focus was just the two girls, Maggie and Hopi, the two characters, and they needed a setting. Well, the setting was I was into the punk rock scene in L.A. Um, I was, uh, you know, um, I was living in a particular neighborhood, whatever, so that was Maggie and Hopi's world. As the character started to develop, to develop, I started to think about, well, they, these characters were children once, you know, 
and one day I'll tell their story, you know. So slowly it started, I started to creep in their past, like how Maggie grew up. As uh, years passed when uh, I go, okay, she's, uh, she's in her 40s and she doesn't necessarily want to go on adventures anymore. <laughs> so now this is my chance to go backwards to show what, what her life was. Basically, like Gilbert, I wanted to go home. You know, um, and uh, there had been hints through the comic since the very first issue of Maggie's upbringing and her family and stuff like that. And and I wanted to show uh, siblings and family and stuff like that because um, my comic started off with no adults. <laughs> It was always this teenager world that they lived in. And uh, I started to want to, to put that in, the, the, the adult world and the, the child world. So uh, all this stuff uh, that I just kept in my head forever as I was doing the comic uh, and the little hints that were in the old issues, I started to piece them together and going, hey, this, these could be actual stories. I could... Uh, you know, um, I mentioned that uh, Maggie moved away for three years and then came back a teenager. And I started to ask myself, really, um, before I would say, I wonder what happened those three years, but I had no, no, no ideas. And then I started to think more like, okay, what did happen those three years? Wow, those are some big years for her from 10 to 13. That's a big jump. And so I just started thinking about it more and just from hints of, of uh, the, from different issues, the early issues and the more recent issues, um, I started to um, piece those together. And, and, I, uh, and then also from actual mistakes I had made, like I mentioned, uh, I, I started to create Maggie's family and there was a family of five. Well, I went back to issue seven, way back when, and someone mentioned she had six. And I said, oh, okay, there's somebody who ran away. <laughs> and so I created her brother, Kelvin, from the Brown, Brown, Brown Town story. And I started to think about, okay, what did he do? What did he do? Where did, you know, why did he run away? Why, why were they separated? Why, why was this family, you know, separated from that child and this and that? And, uh, and that's how Brown Town came about, half by mistakes and half by wanting to just uh, answer questions that I had myself for years and years, just swimming in my head. You know, a lot of, some of my best stories come from, uh, just me going, okay, I set that up. What happened? Huh. You know, what happened there? And, and I love doing the past. It's fun going back to the, their childhood because I'm going back to my childhood, you know. Um, so uh, that's, that's how a lot of stuff turns out, a lot of happy accidents, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So you guys have been telling stories that have stretched 30 years now, backwards and forwards in time. I mean, Beto's done more stuff that has been standalone, stuff that hasn't had that kind of, you know, vast continuity. I mean, I think that must be a relief in some ways. But what is it like? I mean, it just fascinates me. I, I, I recently, you know, as Vanessa said, I wrote a book about Hellboy, and this is like a 20-year story that's unfolding. You've got 10 more years than that. I mean, what is, I, I just, I'm curious to know a little bit more about what it's like to live with characters. You're touching on the continuity strips, uh, um, Gilbert, was really interesting. Um, it, it, you know, it just comes out naturally. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's, you create characters just because they, they sort of create themselves, you know, in a way, you know, uh, especially the early characters. I just, I created a few archetypes that I could work, uh, work with and then from there. Um, but uh, the, the the feeling actually doing it and didn't know how it feels to have done it for you know so many years, um, it it just always feels like it always feels like it's in the middle of it. You know, like like I've, it's, I'm still you know 
uh, this is, a, I'm still 35 years old, I'm not, but I'm just saying I still feel like I'm that person who's still getting it and, and have, has more, have more to do, even though I've, I've switched over to different characters. So it's just one of those things, it's, these are, I, I don't have any real cool or colorful answers to the, to the, that type of question because it's just a, a natural flow, you know? Um, I always want to keep it grounded though and to who I am. That's that's the most important thing. So unfortunately, who I am isn't always what everybody wants to <laughs> read about. Like if I do a, a a genre story, like a crime story or a horror story or something, you know. But that's who I am too. That's why I do the stories. But uh, I I do understand why the Palomar type story or the Palomar story actual story is more important to to, to readers uh, from from me because that that you know you you. You, I am creating home in a way for that, but they're also there too. You know, the reader is also there. You know, even though you might come from a completely different cultural background, it, as long as you, if it feels like you belong there, you know, and, and that's 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 important not to lose. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, Thirty-year story. <laughs> um, just um, yeah, it's it's. it's I can't remember what I, um, I just remember, I, I just want to say um, that the, when I'm creating this world, um, I'm sure Gilbert said most of this already, but it, creating it, um, uh, I got, when I'm doing a story of, say, a uh, character like Ray, you know, and I'm following Ray, while I'm doing that story, even if these characters are not even in it. I know where Maggie's living. I know Ray is doing this thing in uh, in uh, a part of Los Angeles, and I know Maggie's living in the valley somewhere. I know uh, I may not know where Hopi is, but I know she's alive somewhere, doing something, teaching or something. You know, and so the, the this whole while I'm doing this story of just one person and there's no other characters around, those characters are still there. And I don't know, maybe I, it just does come across naturally, you know? It's, it's yeah, yeah. I don't know if that end, if that's connected to what I got you say. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that I'd like to pick up on again from the various things that you've said is, you know, um, the setting of the stories, you know, that you know that you set them in Palomar, that you set them in, you know, obviously a sort of contemporary urban but Mexican setting as well. Mm -hmm. And so, what role that plays in what your, you know, what your stories are trying to say, you know, the the fact that it, that um, that this is not a U.S. Uh, you know, northeastern city or an Anglo-American culture, a reality that you're trying to represent, but but it's one that is Chicano, Latino, Mexicano even, or certainly Central American or South American. So what is it about that part of the story that you're, you know, that you're using that particular locale? What, what's the connection? It, it, was, it was kind of a projection because I, I was, when I was thinking of the longevity of the comic strip, um, sometimes I like to say a comic strip would, would start out uh, they would start at like a little 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 town uh, where you know it was a, a, ga a ga gas station or something, and then as the years go by, that it was more about the neighborhood, and then later on, you know, uh, much later on, it was about maybe completely different characters that weren't there at the beginning, but you know they're still connected to the to the early days. So that's how I thought of Palomar. I thought of well, I'm going to do stories about. Latinos living in America, but I'm going to do the the backstory first. Well, the backstory just took over because it was more interesting. You know, it was just more interesting. I I, I I'm going to I'm going to start with the freaking Flintstones. I'm going to start in Bedrock. They're just going to live in this primitive little town, and this is where the the lineage begins. You know, and so I'm going to like I'm going to create these characters, and so basically the early Palomar stories to me in my head were the backstories to future stories. Well, it turns out that they kept writing themselves. They kept growing the, the past stories. So I just made that the present. I just decided, oh, I'm just going to stay here and do as much as I can here because I like the idea of it just being so simple, just so simple that uh, uh, the outside world just was just an illusion to them. It was just the, the outside world was news to them, but not actually it's something they lived. And so that way I can connect with the characters a lot closer. I can, it made it basically made this little town uh, my neighborhood, basically. And, uh, and so it, you know, it went 
it went through all the configurations that it did, but it just became, it was just so much of a, it was just so rich in simplicity, if, if that's, there's such a thing. The simplicity of it made it grow to me as, as something, uh, the town itself was a character and all, and, 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 and what was going on in it. Uh, so it's interesting because when I did make the characters start moving away little by little, um, some of the readers w would, would say like, you know, the newer story seems like the characters are lost, mm -hmm. that they knew where they were in Palomar and, you know, now they seem like they're lost. And to me, I never uh, psycho psychoanalyze myself. I don't know why I'm doing it, but that's where it seems to go right. You know, and, but you have to catch yourself. You can't just let it go because it could just go nowhere or go to a place you don't real you realize at the end, that's not where I wanted to go. Well, how did I end up here? You do have to pay attention. But um, so that's what why Palomar lasted so long and why it was so simple because it just a, it was just a perfect place to be to, for people just to be very down to earth and very uh, live simple life basically. Yeah. That's why I kept the phones out in the cars. Uh, you know, I just left it as just people like because to it, like I said, it's based on me growing up in a, in our little neighborhood. Uh, I didn't you know we didn't drive or well you know our dad drove but uh, you know we. Basically, you go outside and, and you communicate with, with the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, you avoid that mean dog down the street. You know, you uh, avoid that uh, that house over there because there's crazy people. You avoid the people down the park because they're the loud teenagers who are, who might be doing something bad, which I wouldn't know what it is. You know, so and then you'd go to you know, you'd walk to school and you'd. Uh, when I think about walking to school, when I think about Jaime being four years old and walking almost a mile to school by himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think about that now. I go, what were we crazy? But we just thought it was. We just thought the the world was smaller to us then. You know, we just thought it was safe. It was no less safe than it is now. You know, but I'm just saying that. Uh, you know, it's just weird that we would have our little path of walking to school, and then it was safe because after school everybody walks together. But since the school, the times of the classes were staggered. Uh, if you're small, you were you were by yourself, and you know, mom was busy doing whatever she had to do at home. And dad was at work, and uh, you know the other kids were at school, so we walked by ourselves. And all our parents said was like, "Don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to those people." <laughs> there, I, I came. Uh, this is the last thing. Uh, I did come. Uh, I did was encountered by a guy who wanted me to get into his car once. And I was in kindergarten. And I was walking by myself, and he pulled up, and he opened the door, and he goes, "Come on, let's go. I'm taking you to school. Your dad told me to take you." And for a second, I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay." And then I stopped. Some, somehow my instinct, I trusted my instinct. Because uh, uh, if I had gotten that car, I wouldn't be here to, you know, right now. It's, it's horrible to think of that. Uh, I mean, because some other kid might have done that. I don't know. But, he, but you know, it's weird. Cause that, so I learned about that kind of thing from that experience. Because he seemed like the nicest guy. Mm -hmm. He seemed like one of my uh, parents' friends. Because the way he spoke to me and stuff, I was like, almost like, oh, this guy. I go, but I don't know him. I don't know him. And I just instinctively did not get in the car. And I remember him looking in his rearview mirror and, and then him looking around kind of panicking, closing the door and driving off. Mm -hmm. And then I went home, uh, you know, and I told my mom, I go, I better tell my mom just because. I go, there's a man who wanted to pick me up. Did you know who he is? She goes, well, no, how would I, what would I know? Well, he was a man in this and that. And, and then she got like, did you, what did, what did you do? What did, I go, no, I didn't go in. He goes, oh, good. And then my dad overheard. And he goes, what did the car look like? <laughs> And I was really proud because you're going to go out there and find the guy, you know. <laughs> oh, that's a Mexican dad. There you go. <laughs> uh, sounds a little bit like the, the serial killer episode. Yeah, guy, yeah. exactly. And uh, that, that affected me profoundly because I thought I was this close to just, yeah. it, but it was my, so that's why to this day I trust my instincts. And that's a good thing to do for when you're doing comic series, you know, because sometimes you get stuck on stuff. Sometimes you get... Uh, you know, you get you just get to get a block, create a block or what, and I just let that go, and I go, I'm going to start something, and I know my instincts will take me there, and and it really began consciously, at least, with that episode of avoiding this guy. Well, you know, both in Palomar and then the Loca uh, se uh, sequence also, um, you know, it, uh, as you were saying earlier, the, you know, they're representing everyday emotions and everyday life, but one of the things that also is really vividly present almost all the time is real violence. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the role of violence in everyday life? Well, there was a lot of it. I mean, <laughs> uh, gee, um, are you talking about the violence um, 
Yeah, well, you know, literal violence, people fighting, but um, sort of the, well, there the was violence always a, of emotions. There was always someone fighting down the block, you know, and everyone ran to go see, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I, Parents I, were more volatile then. <laughs> this, this, this comes to play where, where uh, you know, it, it was like it was a different time and it was a lot more corporal <laughs> punishment going on. And, and you'd literally be walking down the street and there'd be some kid <laughs> running around a tree and a dad with a stick chasing him. <laughs> and you just, and people, and, and you'd say, uh, I'm glad that's yeah, not I'm me. Yeah, I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> and just keep walking. And yeah. then, uh, and I should see other adults looking and they probably thought, well, he probably did something bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they'd look and they'd go, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was, it was just some, different. It was seen just some different ser seri yeah, some serious <laughs> uh, punishment going on in other, in, in the neighborhoods from the other kids. I felt, I, we felt horrified, but we had to live with it. You know, because what you can, what's a kid gonna do? Call a cop? No, you know, it's, it was just those days, you know. And uh, luckily, um, you know, there's uh, that that's you know called the question now, you know that you know, but uh, it it was different there, and you know, there was a lot of hostility in the air from that, and and none, and so a lot of times we've been criticized for having a lot of that stuff in our stories, because you know they are stories, and we are exaggerating a lot of things at times. So a lot of times, and we've had people just you know, who've never experienced that or even witnessed it, uh, thinking that that's just sensationalism. And I go, no, it's, that, that should happen. Uh, just briefly, the, 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 the movie is based on a book, the movie Precious is very much about that. And I saw the movie and I was just fascinated. I go, I can't believe they got around to do, talking about this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people dismiss the movie as just a horror show. I mean, it is just a nightmare from beginning to end, that, that film. And, but I watch it like, I, I, I know that girl. I know that what happened to these, these kids, you know, and, uh, you know, of course, they're, they're dealing with a microcosm, so it's all bad. But um, anyway, that, that just reminds me. And so that's why it's in our comics, because if it's emotional or even just, you know, parents treating children badly, that was stuff that went on, you know. And uh, it's not like I'm doing it to, uh, I don't know, I, like, I don't do it to shock. Well, maybe sometimes, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, well, uh, a lot of it came around too, uh, where uh, we grew up in, 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 in Oxnard, uh, which was uh, a Navy town. And so uh, all of our friends were like uh, kids from the South because their parents came to, uh, you know, to li live on the base. And then uh, there would be, you know, and our friends were, were black and brown and, you know, all just all colors. And there was surfers and there was all the different types. And we all hung around with all of them, with everybody. But this is where you learned about racism. This is where you learned about hierarchies and classism and and you know uh, it was something that you know I it really would get me when I uh, when my kids were little, um, and they would and I thought boy they're gonna they're gonna have to learn this stuff, and you're you're taught it by by just by living just by going around and you see like who what people not to hang around with or what people to stay away from what people you like to hang around with. Uh, just a, a whole, uh, I don't know, and, and, and then when, when my kids became teenagers, my older kids, I thought, and, and they would talk about certain things, and I'd go, geez, those poor kids, they get it. They, fi they finally see what's going on, and they know that, you know, the avoidances and the, uh, you know, and the, the camaraderies and the different things like that, and it was a, a, a big mix like that, and of course, you know, it, there was you know, the Hispanic section of town, it was black, but it was more mixed in our neighborhood. In our actual neighborhood. The actual neighborhood was more, uh, yeah, more mixed. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was very interesting. Uh, you know, it was kind of scary too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and you can hear, you know, you, like I said, you, you not only see people doing stuff outside, but you would hear, you know, cries in the night, you know, kind of thing. Just, and uh, that's as far as the violence goes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but on that note, yeah, really. that's the cheery part of the conversation. Now we're gonna, <laughs> okay. No, but yeah, and, and then are you talking about also the, like the hyper violence of my crime stories and stuff? Yeah. There's that. that. that okay. That, well, that for me and Jaime, I uh, was quite. You questioned it. I think he's gotten used to it. He goes, "Man, he, like, I, <laughs> you're what the f are you doing in these stories?" Well, part of it is that because I watched as a kid, my favorite thing to watch was horror movies. So course naturally you know when a scene got violent I was like oh man you see the blood oh I got that but then in the 60s um, they, they they would put the horror comics they, they would reprint 
uh, books from the 50s, you know, in magazines and stuff. And I was just all fascinated by the, the, the violence in them, you know, just the way it was drawn, because uh, uh, if they were in black and white, the, the blood is drawn in black ink. Uh, that would be, you know, like creepy and eerie at first. And then they'd have the copies that were, you know, the real lurid books that copied that. And, and so I just, I just had got this hankering for checking out lurid comic books, just <laughs> super violent comic books. I mean, literally where, you know, axes in the head and eyeballs popping out. Because so, that just amused me more. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. So I, I, I just put that in my violent story. I try to keep it away from the serious stuff, but I like to put it in crime stories or whatever. And that just became something I, 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 I focused on for, for, for a while. And now I do still once in a while. But now, you know, like family shows are like The Walking Dead now. You know, it's like, you know, OK. I mean, that's a, that's, that's a show for families to watch together. And I finally got around to seeing it. And I'm going, holy shit. Man. <laughs> and they're not just doing it to zombies. They're doing it to like just the bad guys, you know. So I'm like, OK, that's, you know. Well, what I really like about that answer is, you know, uh, here we are at Stanford University trying to get comics taken seriously, and oh yes, they're literature, they're art, they're whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you've decided to do bring them back to <laughs> the level of the lurid, sensational. Uh, Mario was talking about the color in them, you know, as uh -huh. a kid, just being affected by by that sort of, you know, sensationalism. Uh, I, I like seeing that come back. Yeah, I just thought, thought in indie comics, at least, that there was a push to be serious, which is fine. It's great, you know. Mm -hmm. But I missed lurid. The lurid aspect of undergrounds and horror comics that were in black and white. I just that's, see that's that's my my trouble. I, I tend to try to put it all out there. Maybe I shouldn't, yeah. but it, it comes out. You know, I just want to do it. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I, if I was like lurid comics. As a matter of fact, Jaime and I are just talking about that. Well, we go into the comic stores and we're looking for the most lurid stuff. You know, and now I mean from like old comics or whatever. Yeah. If we can find or a collection or a book about old lurid comics, I'm all, or for me more more so. Uh, I'm always looking for the more lurid, uh, usually from the past, because it's just so strange. Mm -hmm. Now it just seems like they're copying The Walking Dead or Saw or something like that, you know. But um, those old comics, like, what, what were they? <laughs> These guys were just like conservative looking guys with suits and ties. <laughs> well, I think I'll draw an axe in this guy's head, you know? Yeah, Jack <laughs> Davis. Like, even somebody like Jack Davis. Yeah, you know, yeah. These are like <laughs> kindly, kindly grandfathers drawing this shit, you know? So yeah, it, was kinda, it was the same with asking these old guys to draw rock and roll in the 60s. Oh, right. It was like, what oh, the that hell was is this? Scary. Now I can't get enough of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you look at it, uh, uh, I'm going to toot our horn here. Before, we emphasize rock and roll in our comics too, punk and then rock and roll, is because we just never satisfied how it was depicted in comic books. Because before us, there was, uh, except for the underground guys who knew about it, before that was... Basically, guy, you know, middle-aged men were asked to draw the Beatles or the, you know, or a Beatles-type band in a comic book because that's what the kids like, you know. But they always got it wrong. They just, it was just so offensive and foreign to us that this was supposed to be what the Beatles looked like or some what a rock band looked like. And they were always wear, had these giant guitars that looked like, I don't know, fire hydrants. <laughs> and they're all going, yeah, 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 you know. And it's like, what is this? This has nothing to do with it. But now, of course. I love that stuff. I look back at it going, you know, like, oh, yeah, this is really funny. I go, you know, that's a seven-string guitar you drew there. Wow, I don't know what you're doing. You know. But one of, yeah, one of the biggest compliments someone ever gave me that I've never forgotten was uh, that they go, you're the first artist I ever saw who drew a person playing a guitar that looked like they were playing a guitar. And I said, hey, that's a good one. <laughs> I'll take that one with me to the grave. Actually, yeah. <laughs> So before we uh, turn this over to get uh, questions from the audience, I thought it'd be great to leave it with uh, maybe telling us about what, some of the things that you're reading now, things that you recommend that are doing some of these things that you really love for comics to do today. It's a hard one all the time. <laughs> uh, I always go blank. Um, <clears throat> mostly I'm, I'm picking up uh, <clears throat> those collections of pre-code horror comics because they're so crazy because you know like you're saying these artists who are not equipped to do this stuff but then who would be you know um uh gee um uh, it, well, as far as new artists, that's hard to say because I don't really see them. That I mean, because I don't pursue comics the way I used to. Because before, 
Love and Rockets, and and at the beginning of Love and Rockets, I was still pursuing comics. What's the new thing out there? What? But now I'm so busy making comics, and it's been so long, I just don't pursue it anymore. I mean, when it comes across uh, to my attention and stuff, I'm, I'm fine. Like I would get young people showing me their comics all the time, and I see great stuff. But um, I don't I, I don't follow it anymore, and that's because I've just be, it's such a part of me to be working on my own. Yeah. My yeah, own work. and and even if um, I don't pick up that much of new stuff, I still pay attention to it, and uh, I'm mostly drawn to an artist who is so unlike me, who does something that that uh, doesn't do anything like my comics, and um, and also artists you know that I can't that I could never be like, you know. Um, I'm trying to get think of names here. Um, so, and a lot of them don't do regular comics regularly. So, um, you know, I'm really big fan of like, uh, say, like uh, Lisa Hanawalt and uh, Eleanor Davis, um, people like that. But they they uh, don't do regular comics so sometimes it's hard to pick up their stuff i just look at it on twitter or you know whatever whenever they post something but um and those two artists are like very different from what i do yet i just love them and and i love their sense of humor and and um there's there's like 20 other names that i can't think of but uh that's basically how i what i look for you know I'm really glad to leave it with that comment, actually, because... Wait, I to follow up. Oh, I'm <laughs> oh. sorry. Go ahead, Scott. No, I just... Mary and I were celebrating our mutual love of Mary Perkins on stage. I just mm, want to yeah. put in a plug for that. But also, you said something about you don't... You know, not necessarily looking for people doing comics like yours. And I'm not trying to suck up here, but I don't know anybody doing comics like yours. And I read a lot of comics. I don't, does, I yeah. don't <laughs> see, I don't see a school of, you know, Hernandez Brothers comics out there. I really think you guys are, you know, your own genre here. Well, and also because we're out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not the cool guys to follow. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> well, you know, the younger cartoonists are, are growing up reading comics completely differently than we did, really. We read comic strips and old comic books, and, and emphasis was, em, the emphasis was on storytelling. Now, uh, uh, comics seem to be more about what's springing from the person's psyche, or, you know what I mean, in a surreal bent or humorous bent way. Um, it's more, I don't want to say jokey because that sounds dismissive. No, I just mean it's just more uh, connecting in a completely different way. And we're just old school storytellers. Right. That's it. And that's the only thing I, in indie comics that, that I find it's missing, maybe comics period, is that I don't, I, I, I miss fiction. I want to read a book, a fictional story. That's right. all. Right. Just uh, fiction in comics. And, it's, and since the adventure strip and the, and the, and the serious uh, comic strip has died you know, many, for many years, that's why you go back to Mary Perkins. That's why you go back to these old comic strips, because they were about storytelling. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're the greatest stories, but they were about storytelling. And that's the one thing is missing. And I don't blame the younger cartoonists just because they're, what they're reading before, you know, from, for their childhood, was it's not there, except for maybe our comic and... And okay, look at somebody like uh, two artists like uh, Charles Burns and Dan Klaus. They're still storytellers, but they put out a book every five years. Right. You know, right. so I don't know. There, there might be a resurgence of it or, or of storytelling in you know black and white type comics, more indie comics. But right now, it's uh, mostly just more uh, coming uh, from you know. Uh, I don't know, uh, a criticism of the world or, 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 or their, their, their lives as college students or whatever. It's, it's just a different thing. Yeah. So uh, like I said, the only thing I, mi I miss is uh, I'd like to read a book that's fiction. Yeah, yeah. that makes total sense. Can we open it up? Yes, let's open it up to some questions. I had an eager hand back there with Paula. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's all that. It's, um, I, I love women. <laughs> I love women for all the right reasons, and sometimes I hate to say it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> um, but I just love every aspect of women. I like women the way a woman opens a jar better than the way a man opens a jar. I, uh, you know, it's 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 hard to explain. Women it's sex. I mean, I used to. <laughs> as they say. I used to, you know, I mean, and then you can go back to, we started doing, also doing women in our comics because there were no women in comics, women characters, or we thought any good ones. So we did that kind of like, well, we're going to show 
this and that. You know, then you can say, well, I like drawing women. It's obvious, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's such a broad thing. Uh, broad, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, and um, it's, it's just, it's just a, mil a million reasons I do it, and it just feels right. And, it, and it's uh, fun to do. It's a serious thing to do. It, it's, it's, like I said, I love women. I love everything about women, every, from every spectrum. <laughs> and I want to put it, put it down. I have to. Yeah. Part or, of it might just be because, you know, we're not women, and we're, it's our just way of trying to figure it out. You know, figure out, you know. And I like to, uh, sometimes I get irritated by uh, superhero fans. They go, why do you draw women? And they just say, well, because there's more of them on the planet there than there are of us. And they get shocked because they don't know that statistic. You know, they just think, it's like, well, how could there be? There's only two in comic books. I go, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it's what, what Hymas said, and part of it, I think, is just trying to figure out, because a lot of the things we do, we write stories about, uh, some, even if it's not conscious, we're just trying to figure things out, uh, you know, for ourselves, you know, and so, uh, you know, the most mysterious, uh, you know, aspect of, 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 of life to, to a male is a, a woman, you know, so you just, you just search. It's, there's a longing to find the answer. There's no answer, but, you, but the search is, 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 is the important thing. You know, I mean, you guys just see yourself as people. Well, we see you as people and something else. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you know, I have to add that. Um, that's you know, it refers exactly to one, to one of my favorite lines, uh, and at the very beginning of the Palomar series, where you know the narrator tells us, uh, Palomar, where men are men and women need a sense of humor. <laughs> I was just sucking up because you know, I, I was still young and, you know, maybe they'll like me for this. Yeah, and that's also, you know, art is, is created by men to woo women. You know, you want to please women. Mm -hmm. So, you know. It's, like you, it's oh. like you said years ago, um, love and rockets is our love letter to the world. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, even the violent parts. <laughs> you know. I don't know, it's just trying to figure it out, trying to figure stuff out. <laughs> They just finally caught up. <laughs> I wish. Um, I. Oh. Oh, just what? What do you think about the big uh, that the that comics have taken over and basically our household names now and that sort of thing. I my only qu answer for that is I wish they would have done it when I was a kid. <laughs> It took them this long to get, because uh, they're, you know what, this, what's funny is that they're pulling ideas and, and characters out that, that have been around since 1965, you know, as they finally got it, you know, because, and, and, and to me that's interesting because when I see those movies, I, I enjoy them as, as simple matinee adventure movies, but it is, it is strange and uh, that it's become so, so large. I just wish the, uh, or, or the original creators uh, could, have, could have enjoyed uh, especially the, the the Jack Kirby, who's basically responsible for ninety five percent of it. You know, uh, you know he died. He died sad because it was all taken away from him. You know, and uh, yeah, I mean they lived with it. They, they they lived their lives and did this, but you know, so and it. You know, I mean, you know, Stanley's a thousand years old and he's still out there. Yeah, he's he claiming made, they invented he made everything. Better packed with the devil than yeah. uh, than, than <laughs> and, those. And Stanley had his part, but only part, <laughs> only partially. It was a lot of the artists uh, put put their input in it. I don't know. I, I mean, I like it because, like you said, it's it's got a tinge of nostalgia and it's fun and that. But I don't expect. But since since I'm not there anymore, it's not important to me as uh, pursuing as, as as an art, you know, it, anymore. That that kind of material. Um, I, it, it doesn't bother me so much because uh, you because know, now now that they are super super blockbuster movies, uh, the characters are going to evolve into movie characters now. You know the comic books are just fodder to keep the the licensing and that stuff now, and that's already happening. Um, so you know when I cringe what they're doing to this character or that character, I got to remember it's been over. <laughs> you know it, it's a new thing now. You know and and and, and kids don't care. Little five year olds don't care. They just want to wear Hulk you know masks and do this. And that's what it's for. You know it's for kids. It's for fun. You know so I don't know. I'll have to say that uh, when uh, the the first Spider Man movie came out, I was sitting in the uh, audience and to whoever who'd listen, I'd go, 
I've been waiting for this movie for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, sure, man. You know. <laughs> here, honey, take the popcorn. Over. Let's go over here. <laughs> and, and I go, no, really. I was waiting for it. And I was actually in tears when they showed Spider-Man swinging through the thing. I go, they finally did it. They finally did it. You know, and now they're overdoing it, but yeah. it's... Uh, <laughs> and repeating the same script over and but over. But that's how much yeah. I loved comics. It was that yeah. kind of thing. It was just so ingrained and just like, oh my gosh. That really? might have been a part of the seed of, of, of Love and Rockets becoming what it is because we could see that then. We could see it in 1965 that these would be cool movies and cool stuff going on. But whenever they put that stuff on TV, it was a joke. <laughs> it was just a complete joke. I mean, they got it right with making Batman a joke, a TV show. I mean, at least, I know it's a joke, but they got it right. It's pretty funny still. Uh, I, I watch it with my daughter, and she just shakes her head going, this is great, Dad. Because she, she hates the new, like, Christopher Nolan ones, you know. She just loves, but she likes the old TV show, you know, because it's funny. And uh, anyway, uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's I don't know. Uh, we just, but we knew. We just knew that there was some cool aspects to it that would entertain kids. But the studio executives had no clue uh, forever. They still don't. They still don't like it. They have to, they, they, they still, I understand, I still read stuff where they're like, they hate that the superhero movies are so popular and this and that because I want to, I want my movie to be more popular. You go, well, too late, you know, it's, uh, so they just don't respect it, but uh, they're letting the fans make them, <laughs> Josh Whedon and stuff. So. Yeah. So. But, you know, I mean, they're, they, they're still st struggling because they, it's just taken forever them for them to figure out Wonder Woman. I don't, and I don't know if they... Have they? <laughs> they have, yeah. Well, they might. We'll find out and see how that, that happens. But Well, what I think is interesting, okay, so this is what I'm talking about. Uh, this is kind of connects to Love and Rockets again, is that Wonder Woman's been around for, since 1940, and they're barely figuring out how to put her in a movie. You know, She's been in print since 1940. So somebody's reading the character. Somebody knows, you know, somebody's a fan, you know, but they're like these, you know, 12-year-old boys running Hollywood. Uh, I don't like Wonder Woman. Uh, could you make her a dude, you know? It's like... <laughs> You know, uh, Wonder Bro. There you go. All right. Now I understand her. It's just like they. It's just that little boys club, and uh, and I'm not going like that doesn't make any sense. The characters been around since 1940, and you guys still don't can't figure out that you can have a superhero woman, you know, doing all this cool stuff. So anyway, anyway. Uh, so that's that's that, that 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 has a weird link to Love and Rockets. That's why we did our own stuff our way, and that's why there is superhero stuff in Love and Rockets in the early days, because we did put have superhero women or superhero characters doing it the way we liked it. And that was the only reason we had, we've had superheroes in Love and Rockets. It's just because we don't like the way they do them in you know, the mainstream or whatever, and we just liked it in, in the way we did it you know, our, our way. You know, that, that, that's, that, that was actually my reason for having them in the comic. You know? uh, I didn't hear. Um, uh, it, that uh, Chris Ware and R. Crumb mentioned about all car cartooning. Uh, being nostalgia, and if that's true to you, what era would be home to you? Your nostalgic cartooning home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say, because uh, Jaime and I discussed this, that we noticed that we're, the, the, the comics that uh, affected us most profoundly is when we were between three and five years old. And, um, and, and we're not talking about comics, only comics that are coming out then, because we, we, we were talking about comics that came before then, but we read them when we were, you know, later on. And uh, that's the period uh, in the very early 60s where uh, we're talking about the, 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 the kid, mostly the kid comics that came out, in particular uh, Archie comics and Dennis the Menace comics, and sometimes the, the Harvey comics with... Uh, uh, Richie Rich. Richie Rich and Hot Stuff and Little Dot and stuff. That they were kid comics, but at the same time there was a, there was kind of a connection. And and the artists happened. Well, here's an, here's an important part. The artists happened to be superb artists who were drawing this stuff. Uh, particularly the guy who drew Dennis the Menace, or two guys that drew Dennis the Menace. They just drew. It was weird to see a comic book that, that we were engaged in completely as we would be in a you know fantasy comic. Uh, that it was just about a Christian family. And now how we got connected, because we didn't have those prejudices against it the way adults do. So we're small, very small children, first looking at the pictures we didn't know how to read, but they connected to us because they were drawn so well, and we saw home there. And so once we started reading the stories and reading them, you know, we, we connected to them. But I think that's part, one of the reasons we just keep going back to drawing kids all the time and drawing that simpler life of, of, of hopefully de decent people that was always very important to us growing up and we always gravitated back to those comics as we got older and older so with love and rockets that, that a big a 
chunk of that is in Love and Rockets all the time because that, I guess that's the nostalgic part because we, we, we felt good and we felt that that was something that connected to us, you know? So I guess, yeah, there is, I guess, a nostalgia in that sense. I don't have the nostalgia for superheroes. I don't mind drawing them, you know, because I, I, you know, I just did a Wonder Woman story. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, but I don't have the, 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 the nostalgic pull to continue doing it, like to, 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 to pursue it. I, I like doing it, but I don't care about it because that part isn't... Uh, I don't f look back at the old superhero comics I read as nostalgic in, in the sense that like, I want comics to be like this again. No, I, I like comics to go forward. But I do think back, this is my personal opinion, but I just think the creators were superior then. They just were superior in ours. Well, the proof is that Jack Kirby's uh, characters are making uh, billion dollar movies now. You know, that's the proof. Spider-Man, is they keep making Spider-Man movies, as Ditko and Stanley. These are good artists, cartoonists, that made good comics, and now they're, they're, the, their product is still around. You know, so that there, there's proof right there that, that, that it has something, you know. Um, anyway. Yeah, the, the, Julio's day was just uh, that was early on, and and my uh, you know conscious attempts to do graphic novels because uh, I, I got late into it. Uh, my peers like Dan Klaus and stuff were already doing it, and I wasn't doing that yet. I was doing collections, so I had thought in my head, I go, well, if I'm going to do graphic novels, I better do the ones I that I really want to do first because I might not be able to do it. I'd never done it before, so. Uh, I, I did the first one I did was Sloth, and that was for DC, and it, it, that that you know, and that was for a big company, so I had to work closely with the editor and such. But I did learn a lot from it. It was really difficult, and I did learn a lot from it. So after that, I started Julio's Day in chapters, uh, knowing that it would be a collection, and knowing it would come uh, come together as a book. So I just wanted, uh, for for me, I just wanted to do an epic story that had a beginning and end. I don't mean epic in the you know the, the vast universe type way, but just you know a, a time spanning story. And anyway, that those those it was conscious just to have a book like that, like so I could say, oh, I did that book now. I don't have to if I can't do it again, you know, I'll at least have had that. So that was that was what Julio's day kind of was, and then Bumperhead was just. Um, I just wanted to use those time frames in it. I just wanted to do one of my teenage years as a, uh, you know, as a rock fan, and then uh, my punk years, and then the rest I filled in with just having giving me a, a life. Uh, I just I just wanted to make uh, books with those kinds of story that that spanned a long time. I guess that goes back to my interest in comic strips. You know, the strips. The, the one of the strips uh, that that inspired me a lot is a strip called Gasoline Alley, where it was, it was the first comic strip that actually aged the characters. Uh, where it's, it's about a young man who you know lived near a, a gas station, and he finds a, a baby on the doorstep, and he raises this baby, but they gave, made the baby grow in real time, more or less, and so I was fascinated, and uh, there was a gallery showing of comic strips uh, about 10 years ago that I went to, and um, it had the original strips of the guy finding the baby, and then mm -hmm. you know five years later, he's five years old, 10 years later, he's 10 years old, and, and pretty soon he comes up to literally the 60s where the kid's 40 years old, and he's talking about being 40 years old. And I just, uh, and, I, and I remember seeing that in book collections of the strip, how they, you know, they age. So that was, had a pro profound influence on me to have characters age. That's where that comes from. Because I couldn't believe, because cause that particular strip earned it. It wasn't like, you know, one month, you know, he was four years old, and the next month he's, he's 20, just because mm -hmm. of, for, for the story's sake. No, it was about reading the story every day and seeing the characters grow. And I, and I thought, and the, the guy was such a good artist that, uh, uh, it, it went. The, the, the strip has gone through what five artists because you know it's outlasted, outlived uh, these people. But I just remember seeing uh, the one strip in one of your uh, book collections of you know old comic strips, and it had a you know it had a strip where the guy's a baby, and then it had the last strip said you know I'm 40 years old, and I, I what have I done with my life? Mm. And that really shook me. Like wow, that's in a comic strip. Wow, a guy talking you know that way. So anyway, that was that was a real, real big influence, and I think it comes out in like Julio's day. And uh, sorry for the long answer, but I'm long-winded, you know. Um, Some sometimes uh, I don't have any ideas for them. That's why they go away. I never plan to um, get rid of them. Um, some I haven't done in 20 years because I simply don't know what their life is, you know. I, and once I do. I'll, a story will start brewing. Um, characters come and go because I'm thinking like my life. I have friends that that I don't see for uh, five years, 
and then we see each other and we continue the conversation we had five years ago, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, it's not a plan like this character has to go, <laughs> you know, I have to get rid of this character. It's, it's really just um, since, since uh, the way most of my characters were, I'm not a good, I'm not a good brainstormer. I can't come up with a concept a story, you know, uh, my characters write my stuff most of the time. And it's usually what character has something for me at that time. I'm closest to Maggie, that's why she's in it most of the time. I, I know what she's doing. I know what Maggie's up to. I know, like, I'm going to do a story of Maggie. I'm going to, I haven't done her in two issues. I'm going to bring her back. It's easy. You know, I know exactly what she's thinking. I put her in a situation, I know wh how, which way she's going to go. Um, some characters I'm still trying to figure out. You know, um, it took me a long time to figure out Hopi, but I think that worked to the strength of the character. That she's, uh, I took away, her, really early on in the comic book, I took away Hopi's thought balloons. Because you're not supposed to know what she's thinking. Hopi's just like, bam, something happens, she'll speak her mind. You know, she's not going to go, hmm, should I say something? <laughs> Ma that's Maggie. That's Maggie's job. You know, Maggie's like, oh, shit, what should I do? Hope he's just like, she's watching the situation, then bam, she's, she reacts. That's all you, that's how the, her character works. Um, so, I don't know, it just, it's, so they come in and out basically because uh, I know some better than others. You know, and, and, but when I was talking about happy accidents before, some of the best stories I've written is because one character I d hadn't done in a long time, I'm trying to figure out what is this character up to? And while I'm doing the issues and as the years are going by, um, that story is brewing, you know, like uh, Flies on the Ceiling, a story I did about Izzy when she went to Mexico. Back in that same issue, number seven, <laughs> uh, Speedy says, yeah, then she went to Mexico and came back weird. I always wondered what happened. And people would say, so what happened to Izzy in Mexico? Pe people kept asking me, and I'd go, you'll find out, but I had, had no idea. <laughs> and so that story took almost, what, 10 years to write, you know? And, and uh, it's one of, the ones I'm most pleased with. Uh, Brown Town came out the same way because of the same, same situation. So, you know, I've got plans for, say, Daffy. I haven't done Daffy in a long time. I haven't put her in the spotlight in a long time um, because I'm going, okay, what does Daffy do? What's her life like now? Does she have grandchildren now? You know, just stuff like that. And, uh, and so one day you'll see a big Daffy store and go, Wow, this is great. Why did, why, or maybe not so great. Um, <laughs> um, you go, I wonder why he decided to do a Daffy story. That's because it came. Bam. All of a sudden it came. And that's how, that's how my brain works. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to, my, my, my Hopi character is Luba, and I stopped giving her uh, uh, thought balloons for the same reason. You know, she just reacted. She just, she, a force of nature. She doesn't. We don't know what Luba's thinking. What's interesting about that, the Luba uh, uh, Hopi connection, is that when we were, you know, at the at, at a point where Love and Rockets was getting a lot of interest, uh, we actually pulled Hopi and, and Luba away from identifying uh, as identifying characters for the readers. Yet that's when they became the most popular. It was really weird. Luba became my iconic character, and when it, when is actually her, but what's going on in her head is known the least compared to all the other characters. So I guess they're the Boba Fetts of, uh, of uh, as Love and Rockets, where it's a character that has absolutely nothing going on in the way of thinking, yet the viewer belie believes they're mysterious. Uh, you know, uh, Even George Lucas was asked a question. They go, why is Boba Fett popular? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> I go, maybe because he doesn't talk. And that's, sometimes that's the answer, because don't, we don't know what they're thinking. You know. Uh, we're, we we hope to see them react somehow, but that's that's all. I mean, I use that stupid analogy just for that uh, thing. Is that maybe maybe uh, there were characters that people could project onto, project 
and and they got away with it. Well, this and here's another thing. It's a bit of a cheat, and and I and I, I blame myself for this. But uh, Luba, you know, she they, she got away with a lot of shit that <laughs> most people can't, <laughs> you know, saying stuff. But you know, that's the character. That's how it worked. You know, so it's kind of funny. I mean, not to beat a dead horse here, but Hellboy is also a character that you stay completely outside of. The first stories had that bad sort of first person Chandler esque mm -hmm. narration, but then forget it. You don't know what Hellboy is thinking, and yeah. I think well, that's yeah, similar. <laughs> no, um, I, I liked working on his stories. You know, sometimes there were things I worked on that I was like, eh, it's a job. But I liked, in fact, I, di I didn't know about him till I read his stories in the New Yorker. You know, I had to read the story to come up with the illustration. And that's how the book came along, because they go, hey, he's already illustrated two of the stories. Let's get him do the rest. Um, um, but... Um, so working with him was um, really interesting because I don't collaborate. It's just me. And I was dealing with a writer that thinks a lot like me, but at the same time is not me. And I'm drawing his characters, and I'm going, so I understand this guy, the way this guy writes his characters. They're very personal to him. And here I am, this strange outsider, coming in and telling him what his characters look like. That was, that was uh, hard, hard to do. I mean, I was like, and he didn't give me a lot of, uh, lot of coaching. I mean, he just said, Fine. oh, he's going to illustrate it? Cool. And I went, can I get a little more <laughs> info here? And, uh, and it wasn't until, you know, I sent in sketches, and um, they came back to me, and she, he go. And all I got was, oh, Juno says this guy works out, so make him bigger. Um, you know, um, just things like that. But um, reading uh, prose, where you don't see the pictures, I'm used to seeing, you know, you see Maggie because there's drawings of her. You know exactly what she looks like. I had to read his stories very carefully to get hints of what these characters were like and what they look like. And... And I was like, blonde hair, good. All right, we're here. <laughs> there was one of the stories that, that it, it took me reading almost to the last page where I go, where I go, oh, this character's not Latina. This character's white. Oh. And I had to go back and change my thought on it, you know. And so uh, it was a it was very uh, big learning experience, you know. Um, he, they were happy with it. I was happy with it. But there's still something nagging at me like, did he really like it or did he, is he just kind of like, okay, it'll do. <laughs> well, I think we're going to end it there so that there's some time to, for you all to come meet them and um, get some books signed. There's some books on sale um, outside. And I also want to point out that the fun doesn't have to end here, fortunately, and uh, point you to Latino Comics Expo this very weekend at um, in San Jose. It's at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Library at San Jose State, and it's October 11 and 12. So make sure you check that out. Um, they're gonna be there and awesome, other awesome cartoonists that, that you can meet and see their work. So um, please join me in thanking the Hernandez brothers. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.